Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, here ahead of the opening of COP26 on Monday in uh, the Scottish Government's Glasgow headquarters. Uh, I'm joined today, as you can see, by Ian Livingstone, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, and by our National Clinical Director, Jason Leach. Uh, for the next fortnight, uh, obviously, Glasgow uh, and Scotland will be at the centre of world attention. Uh, hosting this conference is undoubtedly a huge honour for our country, but it is also a major responsibility. And so we want to talk a little bit today about some of the ways in which we uh, will live up to those responsibilities and uh, what the next fortnight is likely to mean for people in Glasgow and for visitors to our city. And in doing that, uh, we hope to give people in Glasgow, but also visitors to the city, the information uh, they need uh, before the summit begins. Obviously, Glasgow has hosted large events before and has done so successfully. But I think it's important to recognise that COP26 is a bit different, both in scope, significance and scale. It could quite literally determine the future of the planet. Uh, indeed, the importance of the event is uh, why it is even in the midst of the COVID pandemic uh, taking place in person. And obviously, the scale of the event is quite unprecedented, not just in terms of the numbers of people who are likely to come to Glasgow, but also, of course, the status and standing of some of those world leaders who will be visiting. In light of all of that, it is inevitable, uh, given how uh, major event this is, that it will bring some disruption. Uh, that will be particularly true over the next few days as national leaders and heads of state, uh, together, of course, with more than 20,000 delegates, uh, arrive here in Scotland from countries across the world. Uh, we also know that certain dates are going to be particularly busy. Uh, for example, this coming Sunday, Monday and Tuesday during the World Leaders Summit. And there are planned demonstrations for Friday and Saturday of next week, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. In addition, the security requirements of the conference mean that throughout the next uh, two weeks, there will be, and indeed already is in place, uh, significant road closures uh, in the area surrounding the Scottish Events campus uh, where COP is taking place. Uh, in light of that, uh, we are asking people to consider carefully uh, unnecessary trips during the first few days of COP. Uh, that's especially the case for journeys around or near the SEC, but of course it also applies across the central belt more generally. Uh, and it would apply too to journeys on public transport as well as car journeys. Uh, we are very pleased uh, that strike action is no longer in prospect on ScotRail services during uh, COP or at all uh, for that matter, but we do know that trains are still likely to be busy. Uh, working from home will also help, of course, uh, but this is already recommended as a way of reducing COVID transition, uh, transmission. Uh, by avoiding, where possible, unnecessary trips during the busier uh, parts of uh, the COP26 summit, uh, people will be helping to ease a bit the pressure on our roads and our rail services, and also, of course, helping to ensure uh, priority access for key workers, such as NHS staff. If people do need to travel, and of course many people will uh, require to travel, then our advice is to plan routes carefully. Glasgow City Council has created a set of maps which are designed to help people do that and which provide information about where and when congestion is expected. Uh, those maps can be found on the travel section of the Get Ready Glasgow website, uh, which is getreadyglasgow.com. Of course, we also anticipate some disruption as a result of protests during the next two weeks, and I want to say just a few words on that uh, matter just now as well. Uh, Scotland and Glasgow have a proud tradition of activism and of peaceful protest. In fact, I have personally taken part in many peaceful protests in this city uh, over the past 30 years or so. The city's slogan is, People Make Glasgow, and that's one that I hope at the end of COP will be applied warmly to this summit. 
So it is absolutely the case that we, and I know this is the very strong position of the United Nations, want people's voices to be heard. Uh, we want the voices of young people, of wider civic society, and of people from across the world to be heard loudly and clearly by those around the negotiating table. Uh, we know there are two major scheduled demonstrations, the Friday for future school strike next week and the march from Kelvin Grove to Glasgow Green uh, next Saturday on the Global Day of Action. Uh, these will both provide opportunities for people to make their voices heard. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the organisers of these demonstrations, as well as a number of other activist groups for the engagement that I know they have had with the City Council and indeed with the police to ensure that demonstrations can take place safely and securely. Uh, we also, though, expect that other protests will take place without warning. That is understandable. Uh, and these are obviously, though, harder for the city, for conference organisers and for the police to prepare for. And there are just some principles, in addition, of course, to that important principle of the democratic right to protest, that I would ask those intending to protest uh, to pay attention to. Firstly, uh, whatever anyone thinks of the negotiations taking place in the conference centre, and I can understand uh, why many think that world leaders are not yet doing enough, because world leaders are not yet doing enough, and that is one of the things we hope to see change during the summit. Uh, but regardless of views on that, uh, progress will not be made if discussions are disrupted. And more generally, and this of course applies to all protests, I would ask uh, that uh, people demonstrating uh, remember uh, and show consideration for the city and for people living in this city. Uh, the people of Glasgow are opening up their city to the world at what is a difficult time for everybody around the world. Uh, and I hope those who are travelling here to the city, welcome though they are, to make their voices heard, will recognise that. Uh, so please uh, do that and please and lastly also follow rules on COVID because they are intended to protect uh, everyone and also respect our emergency services, our ambulance crews, our fire crews and our police. Uh, I know the Chief will say something in a few minutes about Scotland's approach to policing but I want to stress that our emergency services are there to keep everyone safe. Uh, that includes those who are here to negotiate and those who are here to protest. But of course, our emergency services also have continued responsibilities to support the people of the city, uh, no matter what is happening inside COP26. So I would ask everyone to respect and support them as they do their jobs. Uh, the final point I want to briefly cover relates to COVID, and uh, Jason will be able to say more about this later. Uh, this event, which is bringing people from all around the world uh, together to meet indoors in large numbers uh, while the world is still in the midst of a pandemic, inevitably poses a risk of increased COVID transmission. And I understand why that makes some people wary. However, I want to give an assurance again today that we are doing everything possible to mitigate these risks as far as is possible. The United Nations, the UK government and the Scottish government have taken a number of steps to ensure as far as possible, uh, for example, that delegates have been fully vaccinated before arrival here. Uh, in addition, everyone coming to Glasgow from outside the common travel area will be required to show a negative test result before arrival in the UK. And also everyone entering the core venue for COP, the Blue Zone, is going to be required to take a lateral flow test every day that they are in attendance. Everyone attending the green zone must show either their vaccine certificate uh, for members of the public or their blue zone pass, which will be updated with the results of the daily lateral flow tests. And at both venues, people must wear face coverings and follow one metre physical distancing and strict hygiene guidance. In partnership with the UN and the UK, we will obviously keep these procedures under review uh, throughout the summit. And of course, I'd stress that everyone visiting Glasgow for COP, whether official delegates or activists, will be required to follow the same basic COVID precautions that apply to all of us uh, when we are in the city itself. For example, wearing face coverings on public transport and in other indoor public places. Through all of these measures, uh, we can, I hope, reduce the risk of COVID transmission and make COP as safe as possible for the people 
living already in the city and also for those who will visit our city over the next two weeks. Now, finally, I know, as I said at the beginning, that the next two weeks will bring disruption to people living in Glasgow. Uh, and I understand that that will cause frustration. Um, I do understand that I'm both a resident of and a representative of this city. Uh, I don't expect what I'm about to say will take all of that frustration away over the next two weeks. But I think all of us, hopefully, uh, will remember that what we are uh, experiencing over these next two weeks is for a purpose. This is uh, probably the most important global gathering of this century so far. It's not just in Glasgow's interest to have a safe and successful summit. That is in the interest of the entire world. Um, I know that the vast majority of people in Glasgow understand that. And even if we don't much like the disruption, we do understand the importance of what will be happening during this conference. So let me end by thanking uh, everyone in uh, the city for the welcome I know will be extended to visitors, but also for the patience and forbearance that will have to be shown over the next two weeks. My hope, uh, and I know that it is the hope of Glasgow, Scotland, the UK, and indeed the world, is that by the end of these two weeks, uh, the outcome of the summit will have justified that patience. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand over uh, now to the Chief Constable uh, before uh, he, I and Jason take your questions. Chief. Uh, thank you, First Minister, and uh, good afternoon. As, as Chief Constable, I want to assure the people of Scotland that our police service is ready uh, to support a safe and secure COP26. And of equal importance, we are ready to ensure a quality policing service is maintained for every citizen, every community in Glasgow, and indeed right across the whole of Scotland during the conference period. Our policing operation, Operation Urum, is one of the biggest ever undertaken in the United Kingdom. 7,000 officers and staff from every single police service in the UK are today arriving to join colleagues from Police Scotland. Over 10,000 officers will, on will be on duty uh, on some days of the conference. As Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland, all officers and staff are under my command and control while deployed to COP26. Accordingly, they will work to the values of policing in Scotland and they will follow the tone and approach that Police Scotland will apply during the operation. As the First Minister has uh, been very clear around the United Nations, uh, the organisers uh, of this enormous event, actually want people and encourage people to make their voices heard. It's an objective of the conference. There's an expectation and an encouragement of demonstrations of protest. So our response will be informed by and consistent with key human rights considerations. Necessity proportionality, lawfulness. These principles are vital in all that we do within policing in Scotland, and they are what I expect from everyone in Police Scotland and from our colleagues who will be supporting us. We will protect the rights of people who wish to peacefully protest at COP26, balanced against the rights of the wider community. But to those intent on violent disorder and damage, to those who seek to disrupt the climate conference actually taking place, I have a clear message. We will respond swiftly and we will respond robustly. Every individual within Police Scotland has a role to play, either directly deployed during the conference or in day-to-day -day business, ensuring every citizen in Scotland continues to get the help they need and deserve when they turn to their police service at times of crisis, at times of emergency. An event the size of COP26, of course, places considerable demands on policing, brings inevitable disruption to communities. Thus, maintaining an effective and responsive police service to all of Scotland has been central to our preparation since we knew that COP26 was coming to Glasgow, was coming to Scotland. We know that need and requirements can arise unexpectedly and as a national service, we are able to deploy resources quickly. That was evident 
uh, across the period of the last 24 hours, when we've had officers from many parts of Scotland uh, deployed uh, to the south of Scotland uh, to support communities affected by the terrible flooding. I am focused and confident about Police Scotland's ability to lead this enormous policing operation. And that's primarily because of the quality and commitment to public service that's demonstrated by officers and staff in all ranks, all roles in Police Scotland, strongly supported by UK colleagues. I would stress again, if you or your family at any time need police assistance, contact us. Call Treble 9 in an emergency. We are here to help you, to keep you safe. I will close as I began by assuring the people of Scotland that our police service, your police service, is ready for the challenges that lie ahead, both to police COP26 and to continue keeping people safe right across the whole of Scotland. Thank you and take care. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Constable. Uh, we'll now take questions. Uh, we have some journalists with us in the room today. Others are joining us online. Uh, so we'll go through all uh, of the questions uh, that uh, we have. Firstly, uh, Ewan Petrie from STV. Thank you very much, First Minister. My question primarily is for Jason Leach. Given that hospitals and ambulance staff have already been at full stretch, how do you expect they will cope in the coming weeks with thousands of extra people in the city and upwards of 100,000 expected for the two major demonstrations that have already been mentioned? There are, there are layers of health care for people who are coming for this, a bit like we've just described the blue, the green, and the rest of Glasgow and Scotland. So let me assure the people of Scotland, not unlike the police service, that the NHS is ready for you. The NHS is open. The facilities you are used to accessing are available. We would ask you to use them wisely, but we would ask you to use them wisely before and after COP as well. We have medical facilities inside the blue zone, staffed separately from the routine health service, so the ambulance service and other clinical professionals inside the Blue Zone if we have illness inside there. We also have increased the resilience of the surrounding system in Glasgow. But remember, not everybody is staying in Glasgow, quite a lot in Edinburgh and further afield. So we are ready and we are confident that the health service will be available for people with routine events that will happen just like you've heard the Chief Constable talk about Police Scotland. We also ask people to be careful about COVID. So COVID hasn't gone away, COP has arrived and COVID is still here. So the guidance, the rules around COVID behaviours, around your twice weekly testing, around going for your vaccination, all of those things, things still apply. The vaccination centres will still be open, people will still be able to get their tests and people should follow the guidance. I would ask them to be even more careful during this period, particularly as an example to our international visitors who are following very stringent guidance too, because we don't want to export virus, just like we don't want to import virus. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, the next question is, I think, online. Andrew Kerr from BBC. Thank you. A new offer from your government is now on the table to avoid a strike by council workers during COP. Will this be enough to get a deal over the line? And on COP, Alok Sharma said a week or so ago he'd offered you a position but hadn't received a reply. Can I ask, have you accepted and what is it? And just to the chief, are you confident world leaders will get to the SEC without motorcades being blocked by protesters? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Firstly, on uh, the offer to uh, unions uh, around the proposed uh, strike uh, that would affect Glasgow but wasn't uh, exclusively uh, relating to Glasgow, the, the Scottish Government hasn't made an offer because uh, we're not the employer uh, in this situation. Uh, I understand COSLA has made a renewed offer today. We have been working with COSLA to make sure, as I said in the Scottish Parliament yesterday, we were doing everything possible to support and facilitate that. That offer has been made. I certainly hope uh, that that will uh, allow any uh, prospect of strike action to be removed, not just for COP, but for uh, the period after COP as well. But obviously, trade unions have processes that they need to go through, and I, I respect uh, those. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what, uh, what, what Alex Sharma was referring to uh, when he said that to you. I've spoken to Alex Sharma on a video conference just this morning. Um, I had a briefing session 
session with his uh, negotiating team earlier in the week. We are working very constructively uh, and collaboratively together. I've made abundantly clear to the Prime Minister directly, to ALOC, to the negotiating team, that I want them to succeed in the presidency of COP, and I see my role to be uh, playing whatever part I can uh, to contribute to that success. And uh, there are you know, many things that we'll, uh, I will take part in over the next uh, two weeks to, to do that. The Prime Minister and I will uh, co-host an event uh, on Tuesday as part of the World Leaders Summit, for example. So very much uh, we're all working here uh, to the same, uh, to try to achieve the, the outcome that everybody wants. Um, I obviously will try to use the, uh, the roles and influence uh, that I have to bring that about as well. Yeah, the Scottish Government is uh, the co-chair of what's called, European co-chair of what's called the Under Two Coalition, which brings together state, regional, devolved governments. Collectively, we represent two billion people almost across the world. And it's estimated that around about half of the emissions reduction uh, that is required depends on action on the part of governments like ours. So there's a big role to play there. Uh, you know, there's, I'm not going to betray any secrets here, there's lots of political differences between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Everybody knows that, but over these next two weeks, we'll be pulling in the same direction and we'll be working as hard, certainly from my perspective, as hard as possible to get the outcome that the world needs. Um, I'll hand over now to the Chief to take the question directed to him. Thanks, Andrew. I think your, your question to me, I think, it goes to the heart of something I said in my introductory remarks, in that the, the people who are here to, to protest, to have their voices heard, absolutely legitimately part of the event itself. But there's no point if that protest actually inhibits the conference taking place, if it prevents world leaders getting to the event so that negotiations can arise and the outcomes that all of us wish to, to come from the conference eh, can have the chance eh, to take place. So there may well be attempts to disrupt motorcades. There's going to be a whole series of movements. It's going to be incredibly busy in the city of Glasgow. And there may well be attempts eh, to disrupt or, or to uh, prevent eh, some of those movements. We are going to do everything we can to prevent that. Eh, we will take robust measures because it's absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial that the world leaders can attend so that actually the conference takes place. So I am confident that we'll be able to deal with whatever arises, um, but I am expecting uh, challenges to arise. Thanks. Uh, Gina Davidson from LBC Radio. Hi, thanks very much. Can I ask, following on what you just said, First Minister, about everybody pulling in the same direction because of the importance of the environment, what's your message to people who are planning to march about independence on, on the Saturday? And can I also ask the Chief if you could clarify what robust measures means? Does that mean manhandling people off, off the roads if they're lying in front of a cavalcade of cars, for instance? Pretty, pretty certain manhandling is not a term that would be, <laughs> would be used, uh, but I'll hand over to the Chief on, on that. Um, on the, look, people have a right to demonstrate and a right to protest. We live in a, a democracy. I would uh, expect everybody's focus uh, over these next two weeks, although it's not for me to di dictate what people can and can't protest about, but I think most people will be focused uh, from whatever perspective they come from on trying to make their voices heard for a good outcome uh, to this summit. Uh, you know, I, my, my views on Scottish independence are, I think, well known uh, on the part of everybody. Uh, but, you know, the future of our planet is at stake over these next two weeks. And I think that's uh, what everybody's focus will be. Um, Chief Constable. Gina, thanks. The, it will involve uh, physical engagement because a number of protesters will, will not uh, remove themselves voluntarily. We work with teams called protest removal teams. That's up to six officers, uh, male, male and female. Um, and the reason that there so many officers are required is for the safety of the protesters, but also the safety of, of the officers involved. Um, so at times, and, I, and I've, I've been very clear to the, to the First Minister on this over the last number of weeks and months, I've been very clear to UK ministers on, on this, that at times it may well look quite messy when you look at the, the, the visual images that are going to be created, because it's so important, it's so important that the rule of law is maintained, that protest is legitimate and protest is reasonable, but it doesn't interfere with the workings of the conference, because the conference is here to make progress in regard uh, to climate change. So the robust measures does, will mean physical engagement with protesters to make sure, to make sure that the conference can go ahead. 
Chief uh, Constable has been very clear to me uh, over a, a long period of time uh, around the approach to policing uh, that will be taken here. Uh, he operates on these matters entirely independent of government, uh, but I have uh, full support of and full confidence in the approach that Police Scotland will take uh, over these next two weeks. Uh, Katrine Bussey from PA is online. First Minister, I am indeed online and still working from home. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you spoke earlier in the week about your hopes and ambitions for the COP summit. And you said during that speech that the government would publish a catch-up plan for emissions, um, explaining what, what was going to be done to meet the emissions target that Scotland has missed for the last three consecutive years. I've just checked your government website. It doesn't seem to have been published yet. And I just wondered if there was any problem um, and if the plan has been published, if you can tell me what kind of things it will be setting out. Um, I my understanding it has been published, but if you're finding it difficult to access, it will uh, try to address that as soon as we can and make sure you get a copy. Uh, the, much of what that plan will set out will be things you've heard us talking about already over the past few months because the, the target, the, the last target we missed because of the delay in reporting is 2019. So we've already been setting out the things uh, that we need to do to, to catch up. So none of it is going to come as any huge surprise. We've been talking about the things that we need to do around transport, around uh, heating in buildings, around some of the nature-based uh, solutions. So that is a legal requirement on uh, the Scottish Government. Uh, if we miss targets in any given year, we're one of the few governments in the world that actually holds ourselves to legally binding annual targets. But if we miss those, we have a legal requirement to overperform in future years. But we'll make sure we get you uh, the, the detail of that uh, so that you can uh, look at it. Um, the last thing I would say on this, while because we, we need to be these targets that we set are stretching. Some years we'll meet them, other years we will fall short of meeting them. I would rather have stretching targets that pull our whole performance. And we've got to see this in context. We have decarbonised as a country over recent years faster than any G20 nation. Uh, the uh, last target that we were judged again, if we to meet that target, we should have uh, reduced emissions overall by 55%. It, we got to 51.5%. So we didn't meet the target, but we have still got more than halfway to net zero, which puts us uh, much further ahead than many, if not most, other countries across the world. So uh, we've got to force ourselves to do better, but we shouldn't lose sight of the context of this, which is that Scotland is ahead of much of the world in what we are already achieving. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to the point of, sorry, COVID with um, the conference. Obviously, this is thousands of people that are coming into Glasgow. Have you done any modelling on what this could mean for Scotland's COVID figures? What's the best case, worst case scenario? And is it likely that any restrictions could be brought back in if those figures go too high? Well, I'll say a word or two in general, um, and then I'll hand over to Jason, who will want to say uh, something in more detail. As you uh, will have heard me say uh, ad nauseum uh, over the period of, of COVID. Uh, we shouldn't be fatalistic um, or think that any rise or fall indeed in cases is inevitable. All of us can influence whether cases go up or go down by what we do. It's a virus. We know how to break transmission of the virus. So the first point I would make is that we uh, if everybody complies with all of the mitigations in place, we should be able to minimise the risks of uh, rising transmission. So that's the, the first message and the most important message to get across. Um, and on the point about restrictions, I, because I, I recognise the reality of living through a pandemic of an infectious virus, and this is not specifically related to COP, we, can't, we don't ever want to go back to the kind of restrictions we had or, or even to we introduce any restrictions, but you can never rule anything out in the, the kind of situation we're in just now. But what we know for certain is if we all behave in the, the ways that are proven to stop transmission, we have a better chance of avoiding that, which is what we all want to do. And you know, the First Minister of Wales just a little while ago today, not about to host a major global summit, but is saying exactly the same things, uh, that you, uh, we will avoid restrictions 
if we behave in the ways that we know keep the virus under control. That's one of the things that hasn't really changed in essence since the start of the pandemic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, it's a relatively predictable answer. There has to be a reverse gear. The First Minister and I and our other clinical advisors often discuss that reverse gear, but there's also a forward gear. There's a way of getting to the next stage without the numbers going up. It, the reality is I would rather we had 100 cases a day in Scotland than 2,500 cases a day, COP or no COP. R appears to be about one, if you remember the days when we talked about the R number. So 2,500 people are giving it to another 2,500 people. To keep R at that or below, it's vaccination, test twice a week asymptomatically, and follow the hygiene rules, whether you're at COP or whether you're in Aberdeen going about your normal business. We do do modelling. The further out you go, the harder it gets. We've said that many times in these rooms. For the next two or three weeks, the modelling shows stability and maybe even a fall. It doesn't show an instant reaction to COP. That's the nature of the infectious agent. Any rise would come probably after COP, both here and, remember, also potentially exporting to other places. And other countries are very concerned about that version of the pandemic. We, as we get further out, that modelling becomes less and less reliable and therefore isn't much help to us to know what to do now. But we know what to do now. We know it's about hygiene, vaccination and testing. Okay, one final point to make here. I had discussions earlier in the week with the... United Nations Executive Director on Climate Change, uh, and we discussed the COVID protections. The United Nations is very seized of the importance of uh, doing everything possible around the event to minimise the risk of transmission, but delegations from countries across the world are anxious to make sure that all of the appropriate steps have been taken as well. For that point that Jason has made there, no country wants to have COP as a, a place where the virus transmits, because it won't only be Scotland, potentially, that pays uh, for that. It will be other countries as their delegations go home. So there's a real collective interest in making sure that these mitigations are complied with and uh, rigorously enforced uh, where necessary. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Daily Telegraph is online. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I've been speaking to various figures in the legal profession this morning who are expressing concerns about the prospect of the court system being plugged up. Um, they're mentioning, obviously, the prospect of a high volume of arrests, but also that the three major bar associations have refused to sign up the duty scheme in their weekend custody courts. And they think the combination of these elements could lead to the system being plugged up to the extent one was arguing to me that people could be released from custody. And I just wondered what your view on that was. And for the Chief Constable, um, there's also a suggestion that there might be elements out there, anarchist elements, who we seek to get arrested. Uh, and that you might be seeing the same people over and over again um, being bailed and going back to the front line of the protests. Um, is that something you're prepared for? And if people chain themselves or glue themselves to something, but they're not actually disrupting the running of the conference, um, are you still going to use the physical techniques that you mentioned earlier? Thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to Mr. Constable very briefly um, on uh, the issues of the, the justice system more generally. Um, I know there have been uh, discussions with the, the Law Society, with the Bar Associations. I'm not going to get into the, the detail uh, of that right now, but there has also been a considerable amount of work done around contingency planning to deal with uh, the impacts of that. And, you know, we are confident we've got plans in place. I would uh, continually say the scale of the, the challenge ahead of us over these next two weeks is, is considerable, so we're not complacent about any of this, but uh, as in all other aspects of that, there's been careful um, and comprehensive contingency planning done. Thanks, First Minister. Th thanks, Simon. I think I'll take your uh, questions in reverse, if I, if I may. Uh, <coughs> it, it, in general terms, any set of circumstances are going to be looked at depending on the, the particular facts at play at the time. But I think the point you're, you're making, I, I hope, or, or is inferred in your question, is consistent with issues and points of what I've already made today. If an individual wishes to make a protest and they're not threatening any, anybody else, they're not damaging uh, property, and they are not interfering with the, the, the running of the conference, well, that is part of their legitimate right to protest. Our concern would probably be for their own safety, how long they were going to do that. Glasgow in November, you can see the, the rain at the moment and, and, and how potentially cold it might get. 
you know, there's going to be health and safety factors that would be taken into account. But in general terms, and again, this, this, this has to be in the generality because every set of circumstances will, will be looked at individually and, and they'll, they'll be assessed against first principles and they'll be assessed against uh, human rights and they'll be assessed against the criteria that I've set today about violence, damage and interference with the conference. Uh, but in general terms, we will not look uh, to make an early intervention in regard to that because that actually is part of the right to protest that we actually recognise and we know that the United Nations are, are seeking to encourage. In terms of the arrested persons, and again, it's, I think it's, it's linked into your query regarding some of the, the uh, positions of the various bar associations, you're right that that has been uh, an MO, a modus operandi that, that we've seen in different jurisdictions, not only in the United Kingdom, uh, but, but abroad and, and at times in Scotland as well, uh, where, the, where people are seeking part of their protest is to test the criminal justice system, test the custody arrangements, and that would obviously be relevant uh, to any report that we then made to the court. And obviously that is thereafter as a matter for the independent prosecutors, it's a matter for the independent judiciary about whether they are remanded in custody or whether they are released with bail, bail conditions. But all of those issues, we've been preparing for this, we've been uh, exercising this with all the agencies and partners in the criminal justice system, um, and there are a number of contingencies in place to make sure that the system works as well as it can. But this is going to be an extraordinary period, an extraordinary period, and therefore the, the judicial system, the court system, the prosecutors, they, they are going to see some extraordinary uh, and, and uh, extra uh, pressures and demands as well. But we've been doing an awful lot of preparation, uh, and I think collectively we'll be in a position to deal uh, with whatever we face. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jane Bradley from the Scotsman, also online. Thank you, First Minister. I think this is really a question for the Chief Constable. Um, you mentioned that the tone and approach of police officers, even those coming from elsewhere in the UK, would be consistent with Police Scotland's approach to protests. I just wondered if you can give me a bit more detail about the guidance that you've given officers coming from elsewhere and you know how that was received. Is that different to, to, to what they're normally doing in their own police forces? Yeah, that is definitely a question for the Chief Constable. Th thanks, First Minister. Th thank you, Jane. Again, I've been really clear from the outset that we will need the assistance of every agency, every uh, police service in the United Kingdom and specialist capabilities as well. But when they come to Scotland, when they come to Scotland, they work to the Police Scotland model. They work under my command as Chief Constable and they'll work to the Gold Commander ACC, uh, Bernie Higgins. So Bernie and I uh, both uh, recorded messages for every officer, every member of staff who attends for mutual aid. We, we made it very, very clear about the close relationship we have with the communities of Scotland, with the people of Glasgow, the, the communities right across the whole of Scotland. And just as through the COVID pandemic, you know, I, I stress consistently that our authority comes from our fellow citizens. Well, actually, all of the police officers from the UK who are coming to Scotland know that very, very close bond of trust that exists here. So they've been asked, and, I, and, and actually more than asked, I, I demand of them that they work towards our, our values of, of, of fairness, integrity and respect. We have human rights, not only a recognition, a recognition of human rights, but a commitment to upholding human rights as part of our mission statement, as part of our force values. And we will be working to Police Scotland tactics and, and Police Scotland values. And we've been very, very clear on that. And that's been reinforced at the various staging posts when officers attend and, and, and officers are here. So we will be working as a single entity with the mutual aid that's come in from across the UK. But this is going to be a, a Police Scotland operation and led by Police Scotland officers. Thank you. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier, um, again online. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, will you be attending, or any of your members of your cabinet be attending, any of the protests that are planned and organised for during the event? And can I just ask more generally, are you happy that Glasgow is going to be chosen uh, to host this event so close after the pandemic? Um, I, I can't speak for every member of my cabinet or ministers. There's nothing wrong with uh, members of governments going on peaceful protests. Um, I've done it as uh, a minister. I've done it as first minister, I think. Um, I am likely to be involved in other events, so not uh, necessarily expecting to be there uh, myself, but I am an absolute supporter uh, of people peacefully demonstrating and making their voices heard in general. But given the 
significance and the importance of uh, the issues under discussion at this summit. It is particularly important that that happens now. Um, look, I'm proud that Glasgow, Glasgow's my home city. Um, I, I live in Glasgow. I represent the south side of the city, just across the river, obviously, from uh, the, the COP site, which is now uh, official United Nations territory as of uh, earlier today. Um, I'm proud that this city that in history led the world or helped lead the world into the industrial age has the opportunity now uh, to help propel the world forward into the net zero age. Um, obviously, the circumstances are not what anyone would have chosen. This summit was meant to take place last year um, and had to be delayed. We're still in the grip of a global pandemic. The importance of the summit uh, means that it's vital that it goes ahead in person, but it also means uh, that we need to make sure the right protections and mitigations are in place. And that's what Jason has been outlining uh, this afternoon. So. Uh, the Scottish Government was not the decision maker in where the summit uh, took place, uh, but I am proud that this city will be hosting COP over the next two weeks. I just hope uh, that we look back on it and uh, view the outcome of it as something to be proud of as well. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done by those around the negotiating table to make sure that that happens. Chris McCall from the Daily Record, who is in the room. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Uh, you touched upon this just in your answer there. But the UN Secretary General today said there is a serious risk that Glasgow will not deliver and that we are still careening towards climate catastrophe. So I just wanted to ask, how concerned are you that COP26 could become shorthand for failing to tackle climate change? Uh, thanks, Chris. Firstly, it won't be Glasgow that doesn't deliver. It will be the world leaders around the negotiating table in Glasgow uh, who don't deliver if that comes to pass. Um, I don't think success uh, at this summit can be taken for granted at all, and that is probably an understatement. Uh, world leaders will gather here uh, Sunday into Monday, and the position at the opening of the conference is one that sees a significant gap between where we need to get to to keep 1.5 uh, degrees alive as the limit of global warming and where we are right now. The collective commitments that have been made uh, wouldn't even keep global warming to two degrees, let alone 1.5. So there is a gap to be closed. If that gap can all be closed in Glasgow, then at the very least, uh, we need to come out of Glasgow with a clear process and timescale around uh, the uh, the, the way in which it will be closed, in other words, keeping 1.5 alive. The, the next decade, between now and 2030, is critical if 1.5 is to stay alive. So we need to see nearer-term commitments uh, that enable that goal to stay very much a, a real one. That's why, although Scotland's net zero target is 2045, by 2030, we want to get to a 75% reduction because we know we need to act early in order to keep the longer term uh, goal alive. So there's a lot of work to be done there, and that's only on the emissions gap. The, the climate finance gap is there as well. You know, it was 12 years ago that the world made the $100 billion a year by 2020 climate finance commitment. The UN published a report earlier this week that showed that is on track to be met, but not until 2023. Uh, that needs to be brought forward, if at all possible. And then there's discussions about exactly how that money flows to the countries who need it, how much of that is going to be on mitigation versus adaptation and increasingly on loss and damage, because many communities around the world are already experiencing the loss and damage from climate change. So there's a mountain to climb over the next two weeks in Glasgow. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And there's a massive responsibility on the part of every leader uh, who comes here because nobody is under any illusions about the urgency or the importance of what needs to be done. And I think one of the tests of success is whether uh, my generation of leaders uh, leaves this summit with the ability to look the next generation in the eye and say that we're doing enough. Uh, right now, the answer to that question is not yes. Will it be yes at the end of this summit? And that's what we've all got to hope is the case. Stuart Patterson from the Glasgow Times. Hello. Uh, COVID cases in Glasgow in the last week, the seven day average, were the lowest in mainland Scotland. If they increase significantly as a result of COP, and you have to use that reverse gear, 
how can you justify that to the people in this city and to the Chief Constable? What's the terror alert status for Glasgow for the next week and what advice on that do you have to people who live and work in the city? Thanks. Well, firstly, Stuart, I, I've said already I, I'm proud that this city is going to host COP. It, COP. it was not the Scottish Government's decision uh, about where COP26 was uh, situated. We have a responsibility, though, working with uh, the UN, the UK Government and other partners to make sure that it is a safe as well as hopefully a successful event. Um, and there is a huge amount of work uh, going on now and has been done uh, to try to make sure that is the case. And as I said earlier on, this is important for Glasgow, for Scotland, for the UK, but it's important for every country who will be represented at COP that it is a safe event. Uh, I don't know whether, Jason, you want to say a bit more about the detail of what has been uh, done to make sure Maybe the that bit we haven't, they haven't covered is the, is the partnership working across all of the organisations here, including Glasgow City Council, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board and the other health boards, particularly in the central belt where many will be staying and travelling from. I've been on the site. I've walked through with the very, very senior leaders who have both built it and will now run it. The Deputy National Clinical Director is pretty much embedded now to give advice, to give clinical help to anything that might arise. We have two meetings a day, very early in the morning and in the afternoon to make sure that everything we're doing around COVID is being done. We wouldn't have had to do that without a pandemic. We would have had other challenges, of course. So I think we can run it safely, but I can't manage everybody's human behavior. So not just the delegates, but also the people of Glasgow, we need their help. I think we all can get through this with not only the existential crisis of climate change, hopefully being advanced, but also it being done in a COVID safe way. That partnership will continue. The Director of Public Health for Glasgow liaising with Glasgow City Council, liaising with us, and we'll do anything that we have to do at very, very short notice to any time of day where we can help. And so far, there aren't that many delegates here, but there are some delegates here and that system is working. People are arriving with their lateral flow test. It's being checked at the first gate. They're moving in, they're getting advice, there is alcohol gel, there are cleaning teams. All the things you would expect are in place and, as far as I can tell, are functioning really well. Thanks. And Chief Constable. Sure. Thanks for that question. And, and I think it's a reasonable question to ask, given the, the amount of world leaders that are, that are going to be in Glasgow over that period. I think up, up to around about 100, 130. What I can say to you in, in, in uh, general terms is that we have been working extremely closely uh, with our colleagues right across the United Kingdom, not only in policing, uh, but in terms of the other uh, security agencies. Uh, only this week I spoke directly uh, through secure means with the Director General of MI5, uh, and again we discussed a number of contingency plans and uh, joint working that goes on on a daily basis. We have an, uh, an exceptionally close working relationship uh, with the security service, and again I have uh, briefed the First Minister on, on issues that, that came from that, essentially being, essentially being this, that there, there is uh, nothing uh, that has uh, been brought to our attention through uh, intelligence, through information, that would suggest there is a terrorist threat uh, to COP26 from terrorist groups. JTAC, which is the Joint Terrorist Assessment Centre, independently establishes threat levels across the United Kingdom and JTAC, JTAC have set uh, the threat level in regard to uh, the Climate Change Conference COP26 as being at moderate. And what that means is that an attack is possible but not likely. Now, the overall uh, threat from uh, terrorism to the United Kingdom remains at substantial. Um, that has been in place since uh, the early part of 2021. Um, so again, I would just reiterate, there has been an enormous amount of preparatory work in place. There are contingencies in place. I think the, you, you will have seen uh, the conviction yesterday uh, of a young man uh, in Fife uh, for horrendous uh, attack planning against the Muslim community uh, and some of the mosques in Fife. And again, the, the ability to intervene and to take action to prevent violence and to prevent death is something that, again, Police Scotland uh, is, is absolutely uh, committed to. But I think what also uh, the case of Imri shows is that this is one individual self-radicalised uh, and seeking to get access 
uh, from the internet, not part of a wider group. So that threat always exists. That's, that's a day-to-day -day threat that exists in Scotland, just as it exists in other parts of the United Kingdom. We've done lots of uh, preparation. We have contingency plans in place, but I can assure you, uh, Stuart, and your readers, and, and the people of Glasgow, the people of Scotland, that the threat level is, is moderate, that an attack is possible, but it's not likely. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got a few questions still to get through, but I want to give uh, everybody the opportunity. So we'll go next to Tom Martin from the Daily Express, uh, who is online. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just earlier on this week, you talked about um, wanting to build bridges between developed and developing nations. Um, could you tell us which world leaders you'll be meeting and what do you think are the biggest obstacles to building bridges? Uh, I would imagine I'll meet a range of uh, leaders of different countries over the course of uh, the, the time they are here. I will start to have uh, my first uh, bilateral meetings on uh, Sunday, actually, um, and uh, we'll meet with not just uh, some world leaders, but I will meet uh, with people uh, who are activists, uh, who are contributing to the conference in other ways. I have a, an arrangement uh, with uh, a young woman uh, who you may have seen, uh, I think, on the front cover of Time magazine this week, uh, Vanessa Nakati, who is part of the Rise Up Africa uh, movement. I'll be uh, attending a number of events with her, speaking with her at key stages through COP to hear uh, from her perspective how she thinks it's going, which I think might be an important reality check for people uh, like me. Uh, I'll also be doing a lot of work with the Under Two Coalition to try to galvanise uh, the power and influence of that, meeting with potential investors, with a whole range of, of different people. It's going to be um, a busy uh, couple of weeks uh, and one where I am determined simply to play whatever part um, I can to contribute. To, uh, I'm not overstating what that is, but to contribute to the, the outcome of the conference. That uh, is what matters uh, most to me. And did you have a second part of your question that I've just forgotten? Yeah, well, it was, uh, what, what do you see as the big, biggest obstacles to building bridges? Uh, the biggest obstacles uh, to... I don't think there's any obstacles to building bridges. We have, as the Scottish Government, we've tried to do that in three key ways. Uh, we are trying to do that in terms of bridges between young people and world leaders. So last night, for example, um, I uh, was at the opening ceremony, which was the first in-person event of COP, of the Conference of Youth, uh, which the Scottish Government has funded. Uh, we are trying to do what we can to breach uh, and build bridges between the developed and developing world. I've already spoken about some of that, and between uh, the countries sitting around the negotiating table and state, regional, devolved governments like ours, and that's the under two uh, coalition. The biggest barriers to success at the conference are countries not doing enough, to be perfectly blunt, countries not being ambitious enough in what they're seeking to achieve or in the actions they're taking to achieve that. And that comes back to what I said earlier about the, the need to see real progress made to get to that successful outcome. Uh, Louise Wilson from Hollywood Magazine. interview with Hollywood, Alok Sharma said his main aim for COP was to keep 1.5 alive, and that didn't necessarily mean it would result in a Glasgow agreement. Is he being ambitious enough? Well, I think the, the, the view is that for COP26 to be a success, 1.5 degrees has to be kept alive, and I, I back that. I, I think I would certainly love to be in a position where we come out of COP uh, with everything signed and sealed so that we know exactly how we're getting to 1.5. Um, I'm not sure that is going to be possible, but keeping it alive, and how do you do that? You've got to see the commitments between now and 2030 sufficient to keep it alive. And secondly, if there is still a gap to be filled, we've got to come out of COP with uh, what is a, a clear process and timescale for, for doing the remainder of the work. So, you know, I'm uh, fully in agreement with uh, Alec that that has to be what we uh, focus on. Um, and in terms of uh, the, so the other part of your question, uh, um, just the outram said that it will not necessarily. No, result exactly. in so, Glasgow, so what, what, perhaps one of the, the the lesser understood parts about COP twenty six is it's not one of the COPs that will result in a new treaty. So this uh, COP is largely about doing what is required to uh, deliver what was agreed in the Paris Treaty. So it's not a COP that will deliver a treaty, but there will be there will be an agreement of 
source that all of, well, I hope there will be an agreement that all countries come together um, and endorse as the things that need to be done to deliver on the outcomes of the Paris Treaty. Um, so I think that's perhaps an important detail to understand. Not all COPs lead to a treaty, um, and this is not one that will, but we hope there will be an agreement about advancing the Paris Treaty. And we go now to Dan uh, Vivers from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Just to follow up on Rachel's question, there is concern that COP26 will lead to a spike in COVID cases that somewhere down the way might necessitate new restrictions. One such measure, measure proposed by one of your advisors, Professor Debbie Schwedar, is to widen vaccine certificates to other venues like cafes or gyms, and she said that might help ease pressure on the NHS this winter. Can I ask First Minister and the National Clinical Director, do you agree with that? Is this a policy we'd like to see at some point after COP? Um, DV says lots of things that I, I listen to. She is uh, one of our advisors, as you say, but we consider all of these things uh, on an ongoing basis. I hope we don't have to introduce new restrictions. The First Minister of Wales today has announced the extension of uh, Wales's vaccine certification uh, scheme. We don't rule anything out, but that doesn't mean we're ruling these things in either. We monitor the situation um, and take decisions that we think are required to keep the country safe. Uh, Libby Brooks from The Guardian is in the room. Thank you. Um, there has been some local criticism that COP feels like something that's been done to the city of Glasgow rather than the involvement that there was, for example, during the Commonwealth Games. And I just wanted to ask what you feel or what you hope the legacy of COP will be mm. specifically for the city. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Libby. I think that's a really fair question flowing from a very fair observation. Um, COP, like the Commonwealth Games, is a very big event but it is a very different kind of event to the Commonwealth Games. The Commonwealth Games was a big sporting occasion where, and you know, those of us who were in and around the city at the time remember, you know, it was in the summer, there was you know, a sense of joyfulness about how that was. It was something people participated in, even if they weren't going to events, they were in the city centre. COP is a, a conference of world leaders, which means there is significant security around it, and particularly parts of it. Um, so it, it is something that has a very different feel. So I, I think to try to compare it to the Commonwealth Games is probably not really appropriate because the, the two events are very, very different uh, in nature and in scope. So I think for the city, COP over the next two weeks will not feel like the 10 days of the Commonwealth Games for, for those reasons. And I'm not going to stand here and pretend that it will. Um, the, that there will not, although the green zone is open to, to the public in ways that the blue zone is not, there's not the same ability for people to get involved in some of the day-to-day the -day, uh, stuff. So I accept that there will be a sense that this is something that is causing disruption to Glasgow without necessarily the, the ability of Glasgow to take part in, in the event as a whole. And as I said earlier on, I think we've just got to recognise that, but I hope most people, while will probably still feel frustrated over the next couple of weeks as they take longer to get places and you know have road closures and potentially you know demonstrations causing some disruption it, i'm not saying people will necessarily feel this in their hearts on a day-to-day -day basis but i think we've all got to take a step back and remember this summit really matters it matters to the you know the planet that we will hand on to our children and grandchildren uh, and therefore it's i hope the case that the outcome of this will mean that Glasgow looks back and think that even if it didn't feel like the Commonwealth Games, we will take a sense of pride in having been the host city for something that I hope will be a bit of a turning point in the world's response to climate change. Uh, David Ball from the Herald is online. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, the UK government budget had sort of very little in way of sort of targeted funding needed to sort of get that shift towards net zero. Um, how concerned are you, given the UK government's sort of very important leadership role at COP26, that they can sort of lead by example and get that global ambition we need, um, and the impact that lack of sort of targeted funding could have on your own government's net zero strategy? Um, your emissions catch-up plan, for example, stresses key policy levers on decarbonisation are reserved to the UK government. Do you think they're moving fast enough? Um, and quickly for the Chief Constable, um, given that obviously the focus on protest and disruption is on Glasgow, 
what scope is there for the police to respond to any um, protests or disruption we see in other parts of Scotland, such as Grangemouth, or, or is it is your resources basically uh, focused primarily on Glasgow? I'll hand over to Chief in a second, because I know he'll appreciate being able to address uh, that point, because um, it's an important one. Um, on the question for me, look, you know, clearly there are decisions of the UK government I either don't agree with or don't think are going far or fast enough, and I'm sure they might say the same about decisions of the Scottish government. In the last couple of weeks, it has been a, a particular concern and a very profound concern that they uh, opted not to give priority support to the carbon capture uh, and storage cluster with the ACORN project as part of that, because that is critical uh, to our ability to meet our climate change targets. I would have liked to have seen more upfront, hard investment commitments in the budget earlier in the week. Um, so we will continue, no doubt, to have discussions around all of this in the, the weeks, months, and, and no doubt years ahead. On the other side of that, I think while you know, I'm sure not absolutely everything in it I would have agreed with, I thought the net zero strategy that was published, the heat and buildings strategy, we've got our own uh, one of those, uh, showed some welcome uh, progress and some welcome ambition. So I, I do, I want the UK um, as, as the COP president to have the credibility needed to drive a good outcome. Um, and I think you know, the net zero strategy and such like puts the UK in a, a good position to try to do that. I want them to succeed. I, let me say this absolutely categorically. I want the UK's presidency of this COP to be a roaring success. Um, and I will be doing everything over the next couple of weeks to try to make sure that happens. Chief. Thanks, First Minister. David, thank, thanks for the question. It, it's, again, uh, very uh, in point and gives me the opportunity to outline exactly what our approach is going to be. The short answer is yes, we will have additional assets round about Grangemouth. We'll have additional capabilities in terms of public order into Edinburgh. Uh, there are a number of iconic sites within Edinburgh and, and a lot of the, the consulate core are, are based in, in Edinburgh as well. But exactly the point that, that, that you make, uh, this is the world coming to Glasgow, but it's actually the world coming to Scotland. So our planning and our preparation in terms of some of those iconic sites, in terms of parts of the critical national infrastructure, does mean we have specialist capabilities at strategic locations across Scotland uh, that allows us to respond. And as I said, that is in addition to, addition to our core capability of response officers and specialist capability, because we know there will be serious and fatal road accidents. We know that, that the vulnerable people will go missing. We know that victims of domestic violence will continue to need police support. So we will address that. It's crucial, crucial that policing continues for all the communities in Scotland. But in terms of COP26, we are focused in Glasgow, but we also have resources and capabilities at other strategic locations. Thank you. And lastly, uh, today we have uh, Ryan Capper uh, old from GB News Online. Good afternoon. Um, I've got a question for the First Minister, uh, Professor Leach and the Police Constable. Um, for the First Minister, the last major international political event in the UK that was held was the G7 in Cornwall. Um, that had similar COVID safety guidelines in Glasgow protests and face masks. Since then, well, after that, Cornwall went from being the lowest COVID rates in the UK to the highest. How concerned are you that Glasgow can suffer the same fate? And if it does, was COP a, a price worth paying? And will the city of Glasgow think it was? Um, for Professor Leach, um, you said that the NHS is ready for COP26. Over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've had reports that the NHS is facing more strain than ever. Do you understand why some people might find that as conflicting messaging? And for the police constable, um, of Glasgow obviously hosts major conferences and events all the time. How different a challenge to groups like Insulate Britain and Extinction Rebellion pose to the police? Okay, I'll hand over to the Chief Constable and to Jason uh, shortly. Um, look, if people uh, do all the right things, as people in Scotland by and large have been doing uh, for almost two years now, if people comply with all the mitigations like face coverings, uh, hand hygiene, 
um, vaccination, uh, showing uh, where appropriate proof of uh, testing in the blue zone, more generally across uh, the city, proof of vaccine uh, where required, then we can host a, a safe event. COVID always poses a risk, but I would take the opportunity to ask people again to do all of these things. And I, I hope we'll hear GB News uh, supporting us and encouraging everybody to wear their face coverings and get vaccinated and show their vaccine passports when required uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, Jason and then Chief. So cause and effect inside the COVID pandemic is a dangerous game to play. So suggesting one thing led to another thing is notoriously difficult with an infectious agent that has a long incubation period that spreads, that doesn't spread sometimes. So I cannot say that the G7 led to the southwest of England having a higher rate, and nor can you. What I can tell you is all the mitigations we've just described for the residents of Glasgow, the visitors to Glasgow, and the blue zone within Glasgow. And I'm as confident as I can be that that will be safe and secure. But of course, the next two weeks are worrying me just like they're worrying the rest of the National Health Service. The Health Service is ready. My point was that you shouldn't hesitate to phone 111 if you need it, or 999 if you have a life-threatening emergency. And pharmacies are open, <coughs> dentists are open, and GPs are open. So just use the health service as if you needed it. So it should just be normal practice. But COP is an overlay on top of all of that, and it gives me the opportunity to thank my health and social care colleagues who have worked enormously hard during this whole period and will work hard during these two weeks. And Chief Constable. <coughs> First Minister, thank you. Ryan, you're right. The Climate Conference is, is something unique in the effort. It brings large environmental protest groups in, into the, the city of Glasgow and, and into Scotland. But a number of those groups, Police Scotland has got considerable experience of, of policing. You know, we always seek to reach out to people who, who wish to protest, so we understand what their objectives are. So we've got experience of dealing with Extinction Rebellion. Um, some of the work that insulate Britain or some of the protests that insulate Britain have been taken forward recently. Well, Police Scotland officers have been involved in that. We had significant number of police officers and staff down in uh, Devon and Cornwall to, to support G7. Uh, over the piece, uh, I have uh, provided mutual aid to support uh, London in terms of some of the environmental protests that they have faced uh, because that's reciprocated clearly in what's, what's happening now across the UK. And then Police Scotland itself is the second largest uh, police service across the United Kingdom based on the, the history of policing in Scotland. We've got considerable experience within the organisation of police and large-scale events, of police and protest. Uh, we know uh, and have engaged with these protest groups uh, and when they come to Glasgow, when they come to Scotland, they will be policed fairly, but they will be policed firmly uh, if there's any interference uh, with the workings of the conference or there's any threat of damage or violence. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the Chief Constable for joining uh, us today, to Jason Leach, uh, to Vaughan, who's uh, done our BSL uh, interpretation, and to everybody who's joined us in the room or online. Let me just end uh, by thanking and wishing well for the next two weeks uh, a number of people, our colleagues uh, in the United Nations, uh, the our colleagues in the UK COP presidency, Glasgow City Council, who of course have been working tirelessly to ensure a safe and secure event, uh, Police Scotland and uh, their colleagues from police forces across the country who will participate in uh, securing uh, this event over the next two weeks, uh, the National Health Service here in Glasgow and elsewhere in Scotland, um, and all of our emergency services, my own colleagues in the Scottish Government uh, as well. But finally, and most importantly, my thanks to the people of Glasgow who are hosting this conference, who will uh, experience some disruption over the next two weeks. Let's hope that this city is remembered in years to come as the city that helped lead the world into the net zero age. Uh, thanks to all of you, and no doubt uh, we'll talk uh, again at key points over the course of the next two weeks. Thank you.